Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, hi, welcome to Election 2020 Information Voting and Polling Resources. So um, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff today. Um, just a couple disclaimers before we get started. So what this presentation is, this is resource information sharing, pointing out probably lots and lots of things you already know and have seen before, um, but also maybe a couple surprises along the way, like things you haven't seen. So hopefully everyone will um, get something out of this. Um, evaluating information, we will talk about how public, like polls work specifically. Um, and, and kind of learning about how to evaluate that stuff. Um, and then also, <laughs> I hope that, you know, this is, we're a small crowd, so feel free to unmute yourself at any time, jump in the chat at any time. Like this, this is very much able to be a discussion or like a Q and A. Um, so I, I don't want it to just be me talking at you. So what this presentation isn't, um, this is not a partisan presentation. So I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, how, when, why, or even if you should vote. Um, I will offer information and that's it. I will be happy to um, discuss my own political opinions with you, but you'll have to buy me a beer um, later. So um, this is not expert advice. So I am not a pollster. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a data scientist or analyst. I'm just someone who's interested in this topic, who has access to information that might be helpful to you or to anyone viewing this recording. Like I said, this is not a lecture. You should feel free to speak up at any time. I, I don't do formal presentations if I can help it. So please feel free to jump in. Um, I wrote this slide a while ago. So please feel free um, to speak freely. Um, let's just keep it, you know, politics is a, is a touchy topic to say the least. So, you know, feel free to express your opinions, um, but just be aware that so can other people. And yeah, keep it cute. I think that we should like make that the new, yeah, e pluribus unit, like keep it cute. So that's my disclaimer. Um, so this is me, Rachel Olson. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and the reason that I'm sort of maybe qualified to talk about this stuff, I'm the librarian for political science, among other things here. Um, and I am relatively, um, you know, I vote, I don't know, whatever, man. Um, so here's the link to these slides. I dropped them in the chat earlier, but oops but I'll drop them one more time. Um, and for anyone who's viewing this recording later, those slides will stay up. So you can definitely feel free to view them whenever you like. So any questions before we start? Um, we can, okay. If things come up, let me know. So here's some basic voter information. A lot of this pertains to North Carolina specifically, um, but a lot of it is also kind of general and non-North Carolinians might find it helpful as well. Since we all live in North Carolina, I figured I would cater it to our state. A lot of this also specifically pertains to Guilford County. Um, but if you have a question about another county, I'm happy to help you find that information. So here are three steps to voting successfully. Um, and I have, <laughs> excuse me, an asterisk by the word successfully because um, you don't have to vote. Voting is not mandatory in the United States. So I want to make that clear that like you are not legally required to do any of this. But if you want to, here's how to do it. So number one, make sure you're registered. Number two, make sure that you have a plan. And then number three, make sure that you follow through. And I'll talk about different ways to do these things and what options you still have. It is October 14th when we're recording this. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, some of our timelines um, depend on the dates. So looking up your sample ballot, um, you can look up your registration status and what your ballot will look like at this website. The link is here. This is the State Board of Elections. So just want to show you quickly how this works. Um, how about John Smith in Guilford County? And let's see, search. It's important to check your voter registration status, even if um, you know that you're already registered, make sure that it says active. Um, and obviously if you have a common name like John Smith, you uh, can use the zip code here to help you look it up. If I click on John Smith's name, um, we see lots of information here, including sample ballots. And this is what I find to be particularly helpful. Um, when, before I go to the actual polls, um, I look this stuff up so that I can, under normal circumstances, I would print one and take it with me. Um, but in, you know, in this year, I don't have a printer at home, so I'll probably just write down my picks 
ahead of time. And I'll show you how to get some candidate information and how to, um, you know, be able to make your informed decision before you vote. Um, and your ballot is obviously going to be different depending on where you live, um, depending on the city that you live in. There are some things that we're all going to vote on, but obviously um, county offices, district offices um, may differ depending on where you live. There also for Guilford County, there are two um, special referenda on the on the uh, ballot. So I'd encourage you to do some research around these. I actually haven't looked them up yet, so I need to do that work myself. But anyway, that is very quickly how you can do that. You can see your election day polling place. This is just for November 3rd. You can vote early in Guilford County at a number of other places that I will show you. Um, you can see what precincts you fall under. Um, you can see other information voter history, things like that. Um, and I will talk about that more here in a second. So early voting, early in-person voting in Guilford County starts tomorrow and ends on Halloween. Election day itself is November 3rd. So the early voting schedule, which Jenny just dropped the link to in chat. Thank you, Jenny. This is for Guilford County. Um, there are 25 early voting locations. And as you can see, it starts tomorrow. The hours are posted for each day and there is weekend early voting available. So tomorrow through Halloween, um, you will be able to vote early at any of these locations. As long as you are a registered voter in Guilford County, you can vote in person um, for the next two weeks at these any of these locations, depending on what is closest to you or wherever you want to vote. Um, so you can see a map of them. You can kind of see they've tried to spread it out a little bit more. Um, so I highly encourage you to, if you want to vote early in person, that is your go-to resource there. So questions about that? Anything people, uh, there is one at UNCG. It's at the rec center. Um, it's probably what I'll do. Anybody? Okay. So you can register to vote in different ways. The traditional um, registration deadline has already passed. However, you can still register to vote at any of those early voting websites. You have between the 15th and the 31st of this month to do that. Um, you can vote uh, at those places in person, uh, same day registration, no problem. You cannot register to vote on election day itself. You can register to vote, you won't be voting in the 2020 election. They will not allow you to cast a ballot for this year's election after October 31st, essentially. Um, another thing that people sometimes get confused about, you do not need an ID to vote. North Carolina does not require a photo ID to vote, but you do need one or some sort of proof of where you live in order to register to vote. So that's important. Um, basically, here's a quick and dirty summary of Guilford County. Um, 15th through the 31st, you can still register. You cannot register to vote at all after October 31st. Um, absentee ballot requests for registered voters only can be requested um, by October 27th. So it's a lot of information, but tried to make it simple. By the way, um, here's what people can look up. We just looked this up for John Smith. Your name, your home address, your registration status, so active, inactive, denied, party affiliation, your record of election participation, so which elections you have voted in, um, your polling place, and a couple other things. Nobody can see your ballot as it was submitted. They can see your sample ballot. They cannot, of course, see an image of who you actually voted for. But this is all a matter of public record. So uh, I just think it's interesting and you should be aware of it. So, any questions? All right, this is a long slide. I promise it's not as complicated as it looks. Four steps to voting by mail in North Carolina. You have the right, if you're a registered voter, to vote by mail. You do not have to provide a reason for doing so. So <laughs> a couple links on this page. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can request your ballot by returning the form that's linked here. You have until 5 p.m. on October 27th to request it. It must be postmarked, the request, by that time. 
Your ballot should be delivered to you within a week. If you do not receive it within a week, you need to contact your county board of elections. I believe that there's even um, trackers available that can tell you where your ballot sort of is or when to expect it. I don't use them personally, um, so I couldn't say much about them, but they do exist. Um, you need to fill out your ballot. You're going to need a witness. It can be anyone who is over 18 and not a political candidate. So it can be your spouse. That is allowed. Um, the it, State Board of Election rules are here. Um, and they're pretty, I mean, some of the FAQs get wildly specific. I sort of chuckled at some of the questions people ask, but hey, they're important. Here's something that I've heard about in the news. People are not signing their ballots. You have to sign your ballot. Please, please make sure um, if you're going to vote by mail that you follow all of the directions on the ballot. Read it carefully um, because there are some ballots that are not going to be counted because people did not fill them out correctly. So keep that in mind. <coughs> you have to return it either by mail um, or you can drop it off at a county board of elections office or at an early voting site and you have until 5 p.m on november 3rd to do this um, so if you're physically taking it somewhere 5 p.m on november 3rd is the deadline um, or it has to be postmarked by 5 p.m on november 3rd okay and then the big thing about um voting by mail that I wanted to emphasize for people is you can change your mind. Like you don't have to vote by mail even if you got a ballot in the mail to do so. Um, you can change your mind up until the point you return the absentee ballot or vote in person. You can obviously only do one or the other, um, but you can change your mind. So if you decided, nah, I just want to go vote in person, that is completely allowed. Questions? Okay. Um, I just thought that was, was interesting and wanted to share. What about people who are imprisoned or were formerly imprisoned? So you cannot vote if you are currently incarcerated on probation or on parole for a felony. None of those things. Um, if it's a felony, you cannot vote. Um, Patrick, that's a good question. So is there a proper way to dispose of a mail-in ballot you received if you decide you wanna vote in person? I would imagine there's something on the NC SBE site about this. That's a really good question. Um, my instinct would be to rip it up, to shred it somehow. Um, let me see if I can find the answer because I kind of want to know now. I could control F, but I don't really know what to control F for. Um, that's a really good question, and I do not know. I'll see if I can find out later, though, because now, now I'm curious. Um, so if you are convicted of a felony um, on probation or on parole, you cannot vote. If you are convicted of a misdemeanor or are going through probation or parole for a misdemeanor, you do not lose your right to vote, even if you go to jail. So if you are in jail for a misdemeanor, or on probation or parole for a misdemeanor, you can vote as an absentee. And there's a whole website about this. So I just thought that that might be helpful. Um, so here are a couple resources. I, I went to a um, government documents roundtable as part of ALA. I went to one of their webinars and I found some sort of inf interesting um, information that they were presenting about. There's this organization called Vote Writers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, it just sort of has this, a lot, of, a lot of websites are doing this now, just providing lots and lots of information specific to different states um, related to voting, how to do it, how to look up your specific stuff, which we've talked about. Um, but if you're interested, um, websites like Vote Writers, also ABC Vote, which specializes in getting college students to vote, like students on campuses to vote. Um, they really promote student voter registration. Um, and I imagine that this year has been particularly challenging for them because of the lack of sort of in-person interaction that they've been able to do. Um, but it is a cool organization and I was interested. So the third one that was highlighted at this webinar was Democracy Works. And I'm sort of speeding through these because I want to get to the polling stuff and make sure we have time to look at all that. Um, but I would highly encourage you to 
take a look through this as well. They have some neat tools um, that you could potentially look at. Um, TurboVote is one. It's a, uh, it's basically it's a questionnaire that helps you determine how best to get yourself ready to vote. Um, and request your absentee ballot if you need that. And they will also send you reminders. Again, this is not the only organization that does this. I just, um, they were at this particular presentation. So it's called TurboVote um, is the tool. The overall organization is um, Democracy Works. So uh, one more note about voting and it may seem obvious to some, but I wanna just make sure that everyone's aware of this. You don't have to choose a candidate for every position. You could vote for as many or as few offices as you want. If you just want to vote for president, um, you could do that, submit your ballot, and as long as you follow the directions, it's completely fine. You do not have to vote for every office. I just wanted to say that. You can also submit a completely blank ballot. Some people do that um, sort of in protest. So just be sure um, that you keep those things in mind. Obviously, some positions have more than one seat available, uh, so you can choose. Just read the directions carefully and you'll be fine. Um, so I want to I want to skip ahead for a minute. We'll come back to that website and talk about polling and polling information. Um, so here are some questions to consider when you're viewing polls. Um, so what's the source of the poll? How many people were asked? When and where did it take place? Who conducted the poll? What questions were asked? And how were the questions phrased? These were some of the main um, questions that I came up with that I always ask myself when I'm viewing a poll, like when CNN says, you know, 70% of people think that dogs are better than cats. Like, I'm really interested in how they got that information, what, um, you know, what goes into that polling. So are there other questions that you all can think of? about polling? Are there other things that come to your mind when you see like an ABC poll or an NBC poll, something like that? Anybody? Yeah, so we'll talk about that. Um, faith in polls. Yeah, Juanita? Oh, nothing. I, I was just going to comment. I had a tele, um, well, I guess it wasn't telemarketing because we were just soliciting information. But I did political polls in 2004. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, listening to you say who's the source, I can't even think of who funded that. Mm -hmm. but, but I do remember it was very Republican focused. So maybe I do know who funded it. But yeah, it, I don't know. It was very telling. Um, I will say that the president at the time did not have strong favorability amongst the people that I talked to. And these are people in his own party. <laughs> that's, you know, that's just yeah. a side note. But it was an interesting experience. I just needed a job. It was seven bucks an hour. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's important to think about who's, like, who are people, who is being hired to ask these questions and conduct these polls. Absolutely. Um, the way it works a lot of the time, as we'll see in a second, is when people, um, like ABC News will hire firms to actually do the polling for them. Um, so you'll see in this one database, we're gonna look at a bunch of different uh, firms listed. Um, so Charlie says, I always wondered about exit polls because people might change their minds before voting versus after. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Never hear about entrance polls, even though most people probably would not want to wait to vote. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, exit polling is really interesting because, of course, another thing you have to keep in mind, one question that I would maybe add to our list is, um, were the people who were polled truthful? There are people who, you know, to just like troll the organization might lie, um, or people who, <coughs> excuse me, might have other reasons for being evasive or not altogether truthful. And as Patrick said, um, and this is a really important point, and Jenny and I have talked about this, polls are not magic. Like polls can be very, very wrong. So I will show you um, a couple resources today that I'm interested in and looking at, but I think that ultimately um, you cannot rely on polling data um, to predict what's going to happen. I, I think most of us are thinking about you know, uh, presidential election with this year when we think about uh, polling data and the polls that we're seeing, but 
they are not a crystal ball. So uh, I think that in 2016, a lot of us, um, at least I, um, went to bed that night thinking, oh, the polls say this, the polls say this, so the outcome must be this, you know, uh, so don't, <laughs> don't rely on them. Um, Christine, that's a great question. She says, are polls using telephone only reaching folks with landlines? No, there are some, and we'll see in the um, sort of the methodology breakdown, there are um, distinctions made between landlines and cell phones. It's usually listed, um, and they usually do both. So yeah, we'll definitely talk about that. This is great. Other questions or comments, anything? Lots of things to consider here. Um, so recommended resources, I'll start with one that is publicly available and then one that we have access to at UNCG. So peerresearch.org is one of my favorites. It is publicly available. Um, it is an organized think tank, it's nonpartisan, um, that does sort of their own polling. Um, and they will give you lots and lots of data. I recommend this to students all the time. Um, so for instance, if we click the title of one, okay, uh, just half of registrated voters in the US expect to know election results within a day or two of election day. Yeah, this is another big thing with the, I'm sure you've all heard about this. Um, a lot of states cannot legally begin counting their mail-in ballots until November 3rd. Um, so spoiler alert, we probably won't know the results of the election until uh, at least a few days after. Some people are saying it, it may stretch longer than that. And of course there are other uh, factors affecting that. Um, Pew has recently added this, how we did this section um, so they explain some of those key questions that we were looking at. They tell us how many people they surveyed. Um, they do a little bit of a breakdown of like if there are special factors when it happened. That's always interesting to me. Um, and they talk about, this is interesting, they have an American Trends panel. So they do some, some of their own recruiting um, in order to increase sort of the quality of their sample sizes. So sampling is a really uh, fascinating and kind of over my head part of data and data analysis, but it's really important to think about sample sizes. Um, and we will talk about sampling a little bit more. But what I like about Pew Research is that they give you nice visualizations of the data that they collected. Um, and then they also give you sort of what does that data mean? If you're someone who's not super great at looking at graphs or you don't feel super comfortable making sense of all this, they give you a basic explanation of what this means. What Pew Research doesn't do is tell you what to believe as a result of that data. I don't think I've ever read anything on Pew Research that made me sort of raise my eyebrows and go, ooh, that feels a little, um, you know, that language feels a little, um, you know, biased or opinion based. I've never encountered that personally on Pew. Um, so I feel pretty good about it. I always just find these to be fascinating, especially during election years. Um, I will say also, you can download them as PDFs, a lot of these reports. You can also click on topics. And we're in the politics section, but if you click topics, it takes you out to um, lots of different subjects that they do. This is not just a political website, like they do all kinds of things. Um, I, in particular, for some of my research, have used the Hispanic Latino demographics one. Um, there's some really great reports there. You can also, I mean, pretty much anything you can think of, there's there's some category that connects to it. So highly encourage you to, to look at that. They also have a methods tab, and they will um, kind of give you like here's an article about survey sampling strategies and they explain sort of how it's working, how they do it versus how other people might be doing it. Um, and I think that they do a really good job in terms of transparency here. So way more content on Pew than we have time to cover, but I did want to point it out. Um, and something that I saw the other day that I thought was really interesting on their site, these frequently asked questions. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, why don't, why don't you call me? What are my chances of being called? And they do give a, a nice explanation of this. Um, can you volunteer to be polled? The short answer is no, um, <laughs> because it would be, um, yeah, it's not, you can't generalize. 
based on volunteers because you have to think about who are the kinds of people who are volunteering to participate in polls who are the kinds of people who are answering the phone um, when someone calls so um, this is really interesting and yeah i like this one why don't your surveys reflect the opinions of people i know like they'll they'll say something and you'll be like well that's not my experience at all um and it'll kind of you know gently explain that you know your your group your information bubble probably is not representative of um the entire country so i think there's some cool stuff here um they also talk about this code of ethics which i've linked to on another slide um, the american association for public opinion research has a code of ethics um, so anytime you have an organization that will give you it's sort of ethics in terms of research and polling that's always a plus or if they have aapor you know listed somewhere um, pew actually has its own set of uh, ethics i believe that they use but i think they are tied to aapor so it's kind of i don't know polling integrity is something that um, can get a little dicey so i'm i'm just interested to see um, what pew offers so I was kind of interested in this question of, and we'll look at another database in a second. Um, are there any questions? I realize I'm a fast talker and I may be breezing through this a little too quickly and that's okay if, if we need to slow down. I'm gonna take a breath if anybody has anything. Okay. Um, I was kind of interested in this question. What margin of error in sampling do we find acceptable? Um, so Qualtrics actually has a sample size calculator um, that we can take a look at. And it gives a nice explanation of what does sample size mean? Why is getting your sample size correct such an important thing? Um, so I used this one. The United States, as of this morning, has 382 million people in it, okay? So if we wanted to be 95% confident that we have a representative sample out of 382 million people with a 5% margin of error, ideally, we need to survey, um, get results from 385 people. Um, you also have to consider that many, many times, anyone who's ever done a survey, knows that it is difficult to get people to respond to surveys. So it's not just that you need to ask 385, it's that you need 385 completed um, sort of uh, questionnaires. This is not, <coughs> though, necessarily, um, it doesn't mean that if we have 385 people or more, it's a great sample. That's 95% and a 5% margin of error in the medical field. My husband pointed this out to me this morning. That's not acceptable in medicine, right? It might be acceptable in something like social science research, but if you're really looking for precision, you can adjust this. So if I wanted 99% confidence in my data and I wanted a 1% margin of error, which is what sort of medical studies probably would be closer to requiring, I actually need about 16,000 people. So um, it really depends on what you find to be an acceptable margin of error. Um, and I would say the higher level of confidence, the lower margin of error that I see a poll having, um, the more comfortable I might feel um, drawing some conclusions based on those polls. And as we talked about, drawing conclusions based on polls ever is risky behavior. So do with that what you will. But just thought this was interesting. In what, what are we really kind of saying? Um, based on on what margin of error we find acceptable. So Does anybody have questions about that? And again, I'm oversimplifying for the sake of time. A data scientist could come here and give you way more information about sample sizing than I could. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to look at a database that we have at UNCG. Um, it is called Roper Center iPoll. Feel free to follow along if you like. Um, if you go to the library's homepage, you can use the link that Jenny dropped, or if you're on the homepage, click databases. It is under R. Roper iPoll. Click on it. You can create an account. Um, I don't think you have to in order to use this, just the basics. 
So what they do is they collect polling questions and polling data um, from sort of these firms that get hired out to do the polling. So let's say voting by mail. I'm interested in questions that relate to that in 2020. And I could click search. By the way, Roper iPoll is based out of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. So 82 questions that, I, that it's finding um, that have gone out in these polls that are indexed here. Um, you can see also some of the questions, one second, some of the questions are kind of long. Some of the questions are what we call double barrel questions, um, which is actually something in survey design that you want to avoid, basically asking more than one question per you don't want questions within questions because that can be misleading or confusing for the people who are taking your um, poll. So be be aware of that, um, <laughs> that that can affect things. So let's see. So this is a survey by 538, which is a website that I'm going to show you in a little bit, um, which is one that I tend to use. Um, this is a question that they asked. And they uh, you can see that they actually uh, used an organization called Ipsos to administer this poll. They did 3,100 people over the course of nine days. They sampled among adults and they did it using a web-based survey. So this is where if they did um, telephone, they would usually indicate landline, cell phone, one or the other or both. Um, and you can see, so the question was, how likely are you to vote in the election? Um, and this is what people sort of responded. So from not likely to absolutely certain on a Likert scale or have already voted. So you can see uh, it's kind of interesting. They also, uh, looks like they did this in two different waves, um, which is really interesting. Looks like this particular question is from wave one. One of my favorite features about Roper Center is that I can then click next to where it says source and I can see the article that mentions this poll um, and, and how it was presented in context because the context in which polling data is presented is also very important. It's very subject to manipulation. Um, so I would encourage you to be so, so careful um, when you are, even when you have a poll, even when you have the source, even when you have the information, it can be taken wildly out of context in some articles. So just be careful with it. Um, let me see if I can find. Yeah, so here's where they used it, the data. Most voters are definitely still planning to vote. Um, so you can see it looks like they've got lots of different polls in this one article, but that's where the one we were looking at ended up, which I think is really cool. You can actually see the context in which it was um, used. So um, they have topic pages, just like Pew. Um, and I probably need to narrow down by decade. Yeah, 2020s. So it looks like 1500 different questions related to the presidential race. Um, and you can sort them. There's a couple filters you can use. I typically don't mess with them too much, but if you were looking for a specific organization or a specific set of dates, I believe it has that power as well. Um, many other features in Roper Center, um, <coughs> you can look at studies and data sets. There's a CNN poll. I'm not as familiar with this feature, um, to be honest, but I think that it is you know, and you can look at all the questions that were asked in this particular poll together, um, which can kind of give you um, more context as well. Um, I don't know. I just think that they're, it's a particularly interesting and helpful resource. Um, I'm glad that we are able to subscribe to it, especially in an election year. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, are there any questions about Roper? Anything that people want me to look at or want to play with? This is Jenny. I was just going to say I love Roper. Um, yeah. I also use it with students who are trying to write sort of like persuasive essays and who want to find public opinion polls about all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it is particularly helpful, like you said, right now, but also 
So if you're ever like, oh, I wonder how people feel about, yeah, that's a good one. I'll think, oh, no. Oh, well, because I still have topic. Oh, both topic both collected. Present. Let's try that again. Um, I, I do not believe that there are no vegan souls. There have to be. There must be, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. So how many people are, you know, are vegan or how many people, uh, you know, support or how many people believe in climate change or whatever. Um, yeah. So I think students get great use out of this, um, but we could probably be promoting it even more to make sure we're getting a yeah. lot of bang for our buck. Yeah. And they're great about if you want to use this, you can download this data, you can download images. They have a site tool, which is, they're still using APA six, but whatever. Um, and also, it's again, as I tell students all the time, these these citations are produced by algorithms, so you you still need to check them against you know our nice uh, UNCG lib guide on that. Yeah, I I definitely uh, am not a vegan, Patrick. I agree with you. Um, so that's Roper, and I encourage you to to explore it, play with it, use it. The point of that exercise really is that. Um, Polls are definitely not what they seem at first, um, and you got to be careful with them. So one more thing I want to talk about before we kind of explore this other website is this report, the Stanford History, I can't remember, uh, education, uh, education Group. This is a study that was done, they teach you about this in secondary social studies education. I remember working with this. Um, Oh, it looks like it's been updated. So they basically did a study of students' ability to, um, a lot of this focused on fake news. This was right around the time when fake news was a big thing. Um, and so they were trying to determine how good students of different ages in the country were at distinguishing um, misinformation from reliable information. And this report is uh, always fascinating to me. Um, and let me search for the thing I want. So there's a tweet that was given to students. Um, they gave them five tasks and one of the tasks was to look at this tweet and answer these questions. Um, and basically it required interpretation of this poll. So here's the tweet. Uh, two out of three gun owners say they would be more likely to vote for a candidate who supported background checks. This is from Move On, which is sort of a, um, anti-gun sort of lobbying group in some ways. I mean, they, they lobby for other things, but um, <clears throat> this is them sort of saying, you know, look at this, gun owners want more background checks. Like, yes, this is something that, you know. Um, if you look here though, uh, public policy polling survey of 816 gun owners over two days in 2015. Um, and there is no information provided about how uh, that poll was conducted. Um, you know, did they just walk up to 816 people in a gun shop? Did they call? Did they do it online? Um, and basically they asked students these questions about it. I have to go back. And they found that a lot of students were just really quickly uh, taking that poll sort of at its word and not doing sort of further investigation into it to say, you know, well, is this really something um, uh, something that I should trust. So they asked, why would this be a useful source? Uh, why would this maybe not be a useful source? And they found, um, sadly, that the results are a little bit, uh, I think they summarized it as bleak at one point in this report. Um, students' ability to um, basically do this sort of information literacy work. So this, I could say much more about this, but we don't, we don't really have time. But I just always found that interesting that this doesn't just affect, yeah, Shag loves bleak. Um, I, uh, I think it's uh, always an interesting example. So um, I want to show you this election website that Melody and I put together. Uh, I've sent it out on our listserv a couple times, but I do want to just make sure that we have a second to look at it um, <clears throat> because we are adding things all the time. Um, so I have, we have books that are available via the libraries. These four are available as eBooks. Obviously we have many, many more available. I just kind of wanted to do a nice um, 
sampling films, many of which you can either borrow from the library or um, I know that 13th is available freely to the public online. We have streaming access to Dark Money. Um, a couple of these are available via, you know, typical streaming platforms. They're not all focused on elections, but they are political in some way, and I just find them to sort of be um, good examples of uh, film related to politics, and I thought they were kind of cool. Also, these podcasts. There are four different podcasts that we highlighted here, um, and they represent a number of different perspectives. Like In the Thick, specifically, um, has two hosts of color, and <laughs> kind of represents some of those points of view that um, maybe aren't always uh, as highly publicized. The NPR Politics podcast is fantastic. 538 has their own. There are many, many more. These are just sort of the four that appear to be pretty highly recommended. Um, we have this presidential elections tab. I will say we worked really hard to make this nonpartisan. Candidates are organized uh, alphabetically by the last name of the presidential candidate. Um, we've labeled incumbents where possible. If you click on uh, the name of a candidate, it will take you to their page where you could look at their platform. Um, you could look at where they stand on particular issues. I also have uh, clips here from all four conventions, um, which took different formats and had different sort of sections. I chose what I thought were sort of relevant parts. Um, governor and Congress, um, I again, this is North Carolina focused, but you can do this much the same here. And then my favorite page is the voter information page, general resources. There's also resources for teachers or librarians. So if you find yourself needing to explain this to other people, or, you know, if you're one of the parents who's basically having to homeschool their kids because of COVID. Um, we have all these links as well that you may find helpful, informative, some nice, some of my favorite videos that are out there. Um, this presentation that we're doing right now, and then the early voting locations map. Um, I will say, um, I mean, this the resources are endless. This is not at all. Um, representative of everything that's out there. So I um, am certainly open to adding things if you discover new and cool things that you would like to include. So that's a lot of me talking. <laughs> um, do people have questions? Do people want to explore or talk about certain websites um, or anything that we maybe didn't cover? It's also okay if not. That was a lot of information. So, are Jenny, there? Oh any, yeah, um, I have about this. Yeah, Jenny, do you want to explain what this is? I'll show the. I'll pull it up. Um. Sure. Yeah. This is a video I've used in classes before, and it's called Three Ways to Spot a Bad Statistics and a Bad Statistic, and it's by Mona Shalabi, who's a data journalist and works a lot for the Guardian. Um, she does all these really funny, I mean, you can see from the screen cap there, she does all these really funny visualizations, but during the um, TED talk, she talks a little bit about polling um, and she gets into some of the same things that um, Rachel talked about. So Rachel's set of questions um, about like, about, you know, who did this poll, like what was it for, who was asked, who participated, what were the questions, that kind of thing. She talks about a lot of relevant stuff. And one of the things that she mentions that was problematic in the 2016 presidential election is that, you know, she talks about how our sort of polling, um, like Hillary Clinton's likelihood of winning that election was reported to like the 10th, to a 10th of a point. Um, which is more um, specific than we get when we report like the temperature. Um, so she talks about how sort of um, problematic it is when we start to rely on polls without like totally understanding what's happening. But it's also, it's just funny and enjoyable. Yeah, it's definitely, I haven't watched this in a while. It's worth the 11 minutes. Um, I'll add that to the election site because I actually think that we could say more here about like polling and I think the distinction between voting and polling is a little bit confusing if you're like not into this stuff but I think it's definitely worth adding so I'll pop it on there 
are there other sites that people enjoy? I think one of the big ones, um, 270 to win is something that I used a lot when I was doing like teaching. Um, it's an interactive sort of thing. Um, they make their predictions, um, but you can also manipulate it. So I can see, you know, I could change it to this, uh, I changed North Carolina to definitely democratic, likely democratic, leading democratic, or a toss up. And the same is true with Republican. And you can see as I'm clicking it, it affects the, um, you need 270 votes to win the electoral college. Um, and so it affects the, prediction there. I like to, they have a reset. Yeah, reset. Um, I'm always interested in what their current predictions are. I think that, um, you know, the brown states are the ones that are the toss-ups, the battleground states, and so those are always sort of going to be labeled as toss-ups until probably, probably even the week of the election. Um, they do the same thing for Senate, House, and Governor races, though. So, um, I, we are having a, uh, gubernatorial race in North Carolina this year. You can see all the other states that are electing governors and you could see, um, you know, what they're predicting um, as well as, you know, you can change it, manipulate it. You can also share your predictions with other people. So that's 270. 538, which I like, um, but I have a lot of feelings about. Um, if you go to, I like their interactive presidential forecast, and I will send this to y'all right now. Um, they basically what they did was they ran simulations of the election, says 40,000 times. They took a sample of 100, um, and basically this is their sort of like their modeling, their predictions. Again, polls are certainly not guarantees. These people cannot tell the future. Um, wild things happen and I don't know, but I think these are good teaching tools if nothing else. Um, they have this cute little fox that follows you around the website and kind of explains some of the data. Um, this is one of my favorites, the snake chart that shows you, you know, which states are predicted to go which way. Um, the point at which you would hit 270 electoral votes. You can interact with these. Like if I click on North Carolina, it takes me to a specific analysis of the situation in North Carolina. Um, and you can see the forecast for our Senate, for our House. You can manipulate this in all kinds of ways. Data visualization is certainly not my specialty, but it is something that I, uh, I like to look at data visualizations. So, and they're also fairly transparent. Uh, about their stuff too. Feminists, anything else before I stop sharing my screen? I'm also happy to talk more. Okay, bye Christine, thanks for coming. Any questions? That was a lot. Well, thank you for coming. I hope that's informative. You can feel free to share the slides with anyone you like. Uh, yeah, 270 to, win. <laughs> 270 to win and 538 are always like, they, they'll raise your blood pressure for sure. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for doing this. I learned a lot and I think people who are here learned a lot. Um, Please feel free to let me know. I am trying to keep you all VLC up for the rest of this semester, at least until like Thanksgiving, maybe a little beyond. If anybody here has ideas for sessions they'd like to see or would like to lead, please let me know. But we do have another UL VLC this week. The fourth installment of Letters from SCUA is happening on Friday. Um, and I don't know, Patrick, are you involved in that one? I yeah, it's, it's gonna be angry letter edition. Ooh, I'm definitely gonna be fun. angry. Um, because the second one was like it was a little dark. Um, so, but uh, but I I'm happy with angry. We can we can we can work with that. All right, y'all. Well, this has been recorded. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.